Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining. We will just give it one more second as everyone connects to audio. So thank you so much, everyone, for joining this event and celebration of the launch of the Global School's new online toolkit. We are very excited to welcome you here to discuss this toolkit and to meet with some of the academics and practitioners that worked on this toolkit. We are very excited to hear from a variety of panelists and speakers today. And our first speaker will be Director uh, Sam Loney, the Director of the Global Schools Program. Uh, we ask you if you can please keep your microphones on mute during this session, and I will be your moderator for the duration of our program uh, this morning. So without further ado, we will get started with our programming, and I will turn it over uh, to Sam for a proper welcome to the session. Thank you. Thank you so much, Amanda. Uh, um, it's so wonderful to see so many uh, familiar and new faces from around the world uh, as we uh, launch the Global Schools ESD Toolkit. Uh, this is a project that's been in the works for four years. So uh, we are incredibly pleased and, and uh, to some extent uh, relieved because we have been working on it for so long to uh, finally launch this. And we're very excited for, for what comes after. Um, uh, first and foremost, I would like to uh, offer my thanks to all the people that were involved um, in, in, in the project and in the uh, creation of this toolkit. Uh, first and foremost, uh, uh, I want to thank Simmons Gamesa for their uh, generous support of Global Schools in this project. And we really look forward to continued collaboration. And of course, a very special thank you to um, our wonderful country partners uh, in, in Morocco, the Mohammed VI Foundation for Envir Environmental Protection, and al University in particular, uh, Ms. Mayam Khodadari, uh, and Professor Merzouk, and uh, Kenza, and the rest of the uh, research team and staff that were involved in the project. In Ghana, I want uh, to issue a special thank you to Millennium Promise and University of Education Ghana, Chief now Professor Andrew and Dr. Uh, Richardson, who, who have joined us today. Uh, and in Turkey, uh, Hasatepe University and uh, Professor yeah. Mustafa Ozturk and uh, Dr. Soysal, Anesha Soysal, who's, who's here and the rest of the colleagues. Uh, it, it, we're very lucky to have such wonderful uh, country partners and, and brilliant academics and researchers and uh, practitioners who, who helped uh, run this project for 18 months, which really became the basis uh, for, for the work that we are presenting here today. And we'll be very uh, happy to hear from them later in, in the program. Uh, although unfortunately, uh, Professor uh, Ustork from Turkey is unable to join because there has been a last minute um, urgent matter that he has to attend to. So he will not be able to join us, but uh, uh, we, we, we were certainly still thankful to, for his efforts. And um, I also want to thank the STSN Networks team and the SDG Academy for their support. Uh, and of course, to our wonderful advisors, um, uh, Professor Aaron Alan Reed, Professor Fernando Rimes, uh, Professor Oren Pismoni uh, Levy, and uh, Professor Tibbetts, who's with us today and who was the co author. And of course, to everyone else who contributed to the uh, uh, brainstorming, including our wonderful colleagues from uh, Teachers College, Colum uh, Columbia University, uh, NISM. Think Equal, CSD, the Ban Ki Moon Center, and many, many others who uh, had conversations with us about this, gave us feedback, and and helped brainstorm on on what the best approaches to take. And uh, finally, uh, to our author and wonderful editor team, um, uh, and including our chief author, Dr. Felicia Tibbetts, who is with us and who you will hear from shortly, whose expertise I think was a real driving force behind this project from the very beginning on, on how we set it up and tested it to, to the, the final uh, toolkit. And uh, we have learned so much from, from her expertise and her experience, and we, we couldn't have asked for a um, better academic lead and a, a, a better uh, advisor and expert at, at the helm of this project. So we are extremely thankful to her and for, for her efforts. And of course, to my uh, wonderful colleagues, Amanda and Gabriella, who co-authored the report and for all the immense amount of work they put in uh, on this project, but also did due diligence, which at the same time was combined with incredibly creative ideas and 
and really I, I, I want to sincerely thank them for their incredible uh, effort in getting this together. Um, and of course, all of those people who, who help with the, with the feedback, including um, uh, Dr. Amber Webb, um, well, my colleague Julia Guimo, um, uh, for helping kickstart this project, uh, I.D. Bian, uh, Brenda Garcia Mian, who was instrumental for the evaluation, and finally Mr. Christopher Cohn. Uh, as you can see, this has been a big project. It's taken us a long time, and uh, we believe it was very much worth every effort. Um, and I do think it's important to thank all the Fulbright partners because they each contributed um, to this. Um, at the same time, I also think it's important to highlight the, the, the vision behind this project and how that has evolved. But really, the, the, the ultimate vision was uh, really uh, based on, on, on the fact that we saw research that showed that, um, uh, you know, uh, that we, we came across uh, systematic reviews that showed that um, education for sustainable development and its core pedagogical features um, have been very effective for enhancing not just educational outcomes, but also social and environmental goals. So it's win-win for society and win-win for, for education. And there was quite a bit of um, uh, research on this. Um, uh, so uh, these are important for uh, improving national education systems and also working towards the 2030 agenda and the Paris Climate Agreement. Uh, but at the same time, we saw that, um, you know, according to UNESCO and a number of other reports, that uh, there wasn't a lot of ESC uh, being implemented in the classrooms and in education systems around the world. And we just really saw this as a missed opportunities for learners, the communities, for the countries and the, uh, the 2030 agenda as a whole. Um, don't get me wrong, there have been lots of commitments, but when it comes to the implementation, as we show in the toolkit, there, 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 there have been uh, uh, many gaps. Uh, and so we firstly tried to understand this. Why is this the case? Um, and how could we help solve it? Because um, ESD we see as, as a major tool for uh, the transformation uh, needed for, uh, for uh, our societies and, and also, as I mentioned, in our educations, um, our education systems. And so we wanted to see, you know, how can we actually tackle this? Um, so after many conversations with experts and practitioners in the field, we managed to identify some gaps um, and some, some potential solutions. And so based on that advice that we got, we built an initial um, uh, draft toolkit, if you like, to test out our approach uh, we, uh, with a series of uh, pilot countries. So we partnered with five wonderful organizations across three countries that I mentioned to do exactly this over an 18 month period. And we were truly uh, impressed uh, by the teams and the quality of the research and their local efforts, but also by the outcomes that they managed to achieve. And this was by the way, at the height of the COVID pandemic. And so we, 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 we saw some incredible um, um, uh, work being done and some innovations that we truly learned from. And so based on that feedback and based on that experience in our testing and our own learning and the evaluation that was done afterwards, um, which I just briefly mentioned, and of course the feedback from our wonderful local researchers and local teams, um, we combined that with additional input from, from experts in the field and as a result, uh, four years later, we have finally put together this guide. And essentially, this guide we see as a uh, as a step-by-step -step or a tool or, or, or a, a, an approach with uh, the relative with, with, with the necessary frameworks and tools which governments, researchers, and practitioners around the world can use to evaluate ESD in their education systems, but also to build new ESD curriculum, to test this curriculum and find uh, creative ways to scale it up. And this is, by the way, I want to really emphasize this, this is not about a prescription, this is about just finding tools that have shown um, uh, promise in other parts of the world. And based on this, and as well as um, uh, research done by others and expertise, a way for us to um, uh, uh, do an, a needs assessment in the country and find ways to scale up ESD. But of course, in every country that looks quite different. Uh, in every country, there are adaptation, necessary adaptations and changes that need to be made. But I think this is, we believe that it's a good um, tool for providing a baseline and a start for, for these changes. But it's also important to note that this toolkit is not about um, the overhaul of the national education curriculum and, and putting in 
ESD into it or, or replacing it with ESD, but it is really to use the existing curriculum and to use it um, and creatively adapt it to uh, be aligned with ESD in a way that really is, um, is coherent with, with the existing uh, uh, laws, policies, um, as well as norms in the country, but also um, in the education system. So this, in this guide, we provide a framework for existing, those local, uh, existing local frameworks um, and building on them um, instead of a top-down approach. And I should also say that it is a, a living document in the sense that we uh, uh, will be constantly updating it um, based on your feedback. So anyone that uh, would like to use this, we encourage you to reach out to us and share your thoughts. We, we would love to hear and, and make this a, uh, a process where we're constantly incorporating feedback and making the toolkit better and better and generating perhaps case studies. And in a couple of weeks in partnership with our wonderful networks team, we'll begin using it um, in, in a series of countries. And so we're very, very excited for that. And I will wrap up by saying that given the intensity of the global challenges facing future generations, I think uh, policymakers have a responsibility to transform their national education systems so that children are prepared for such a future. We believe that um, ESD should be a critical part of that for the reasons I mentioned before, because not only is it able to um, equip children with the necessary skills, values to shape more sustainable um, and resilient communities, but also be able to actually thrive uh, in, in the global economy. And really the purpose of this toolkit is, is, is to enable policy changes and um, influence the national educational strategies in an inclusive manner and enable that to be achieved. And so with that, I really want to uh, thank you and say how excited we are uh, uh, for, for this launch. And with that, I hand back to Amanda. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much, Sam, for those wonderful words and for welcoming, welcoming us here today as we kick off this launch event. So I will now turn it over to Rocio Mian Almonte, and she is representing us uh, from Simmons Gamisa as well as from Simmons Energy. She is in charge of promoting technological change um, and in charge of Simmons Gamisa's uh, social commitment. So we are very excited to hear from her and hear from her wonderful years of experience and hear as well um, her thoughts on this project. So we'll turn it over to you, Rocio. Thank you so much, Amanda. And thank you, SDSN and Global School for inviting us today. Siemens Gamesa, for those who don't know us, is a global energy leader present in more than 90 countries with a workforce of 28 thousand people around the world. More than 40 years ago, we embarked on this fascinating journey of transforming the energy industry. We honored the wind using state-of-the-art technology and became that became gold standard. Our ultimate goal since the beginning was to ensure affordable, reliable, sustainable, and modern energy for all. As you know, that is goal seven of the UN Sustainable Development Goals. It remains goal number one for us. SDG seven is essential to meet 2030 UN Agenda for Sustainable Development, the most ambitious roadmap humanity has ever set for itself. So the energy transition to a net zero emission world by 2050 is a highly complex. 45% of all the emission savings will come from technology that have not yet reached the market. So we will need a lot of talent, brains, and expertise to invent and tailor future technologies. And this talent and expertise will come from people who are still seated on behind desk, school desk, no? That's why in 2020, Siemens Kamesa launched its social commitment with a mission among others to attract young people to STEM, science, technology, engineering and mathematics in order to shape a sustainable future thanks to a sustainable development. And that is also why social commitment is supporting global school program and its toolkit for policymakers and the education community in creating locally relevant curriculum on sustainable development. 
The planet doesn't negotiate. As humans, we have a problem. And that problem is climate change. It needs to be fixed, applying new skills by a global and diverse community. The toolkit produced by the Global School will help shape that community. We share that. A community made by custodians of scarce resources that will have to adapt to rapid technological change and to new ways of working, thinking, but also living. The stakes for the world are very high. As a global energy leader at the center of the energy revolution, it was an easy choice to be part of this project, obviously. As I mentioned before, 2020 was the year we started to become operational as a social engagement department, January 2020. A year that was to leave its mark on all of us because of a virus named Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome Coronavirus 2, also known as COVID-19. COVID-19 highlighted our weaknesses, the simmering problems regarding the universal right to quality education were further exacerbated. Inequities and misalignment between resources and needs in rich and poor countries alike, between the haves and the not-haves, were exposed in full display. It did also prove our capacity as individuals and community for resilience, especially that of children. It is now up to us, to all of us, to prevent problems from festering policymakers, non-governmental organizations, teachers, but also the private sector. Otherwise, we run the risk of the gap widening between the haves and the not-haves. A year before COVID, Greta Thunberg, the Swedish school girl who inspired a global movement to fight climate change among young people, was named Time Magazine Person of the Year. She sparked a worldwide movement the Fridays for Future. I'm sure you all remember that. The Collins Dictionary named Thunberg's pioneering idea, Climate Strike, the word of the year. Children around the world became climate activists overnight. It was not a fact, but a real concern among young people about climate change and everything related to environment. The concern still exists, and this concern is already shaping today's reality. According to UNICEF, almost every child, child on Earth is exposed to climate and environmental hazards, while approximately 1 billion children are at an extremely high risk of the impact of climate crisis. If school is a place where we prepare the next generation of professionals and citizens, shouldn't education for sustainable development be part of any curriculum? in the world. Shouldn't we promote curiosity, critical thinking, and problem solving about this issue in the classroom? From a department which promotes STEM for a strong and diverse workforce to face the entire energy transition, we cannot stay out of this problem. Because as Greta Thunberg said in her speech in, 19, in 2019 in New York, at the global Climate Action Summit. The eyes of the future generation are upon you. And if you choose to fail us, I say, I will never forgive you. Then thank you so much, all of the participants who made possible this amazing toolkit. And thank you. Go back to you, Amanda. Thank you so much, Rocio, for your continuous re support and also this relationship that we've built over the past uh, through a few months. And we truly appreciate it and all of the incredible work that uh, you're doing in many spaces when it comes to social impact. Thank you. So That's now we will turn it over to uh, Professor Tibbet. And she will be talking a little bit more about the technical aspects of the toolkit itself. And we will also uh, be dropping the link of the toolkit into the chat. So please take a look. Um, before I introduce her, I would like to remind everyone to please keep your microphones on mute so we can hear the speakers. So Professor Tibbetts is the UNESCO Chair in Human Rights and Higher Education and the Chair in Human Rights Education at the Human Rights Center of Utrecht University in the Netherlands. 
Uh, she's dedicated to the role that education can play in advancing human rights. Her interests include peace, human rights, ESD and global citizenship education, curriculum policy and reform, uh, critical pedagogy and higher education transformation. Uh, she has widespread scholarship in a variety of areas and she has written many practical resources on curriculum uh, program development and evaluation on behalf of the Office of the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, UNICEF, uh, UNESCO, and among many other multilateral, multilateral and government organizations. We are extremely lucky to have her here um, as a lead author and also here to explain uh, the work in more detail. So, um, Professor, over to you. Thank you so much, Amanda, for the um, introduction. It's always a little embarrassing when you get an introduction like that. But I want to begin by thanking you and Sam and Gabriela for the great collegiality that we had together in working on this on this toolkit. And as Sam Sam's introduction demonstrated, it's this is so much um, a, a, a team effort, not only in the actual writing of the toolkit, but drawing on the amazing experiences of the Global Schools Program over these last years. So I'm very grateful to have had the invitation to work with you all on the toolkit. And it has been um, hard work, but also a labor of love because of the team. And we're all very, very motivated, of course, to get the toolkit out there and to get it uh, into more hands so that we can have ESD, more ESD curriculum in the schools. So let me go ahead. I'm gonna share my screen now. And um, as Amanda said, my, my, sorry, I'm just setting us up now. My uh, agenda for us today is to just really uh, introduce you to the toolkit and it's how it was conceptualized. So you just have an idea of what's in it because it's quite long. It's, um, we hope, very handy and practice oriented. That was the idea. So this is really just a kind of orientation to the toolkit, but I'm gonna walk you through some of the main sections and give you a few examples. Hopefully you will be even more motivated to make use of it in your own national environment. So this is the name Practical Guide for Integrating Sustainable Development for National Education Priorities. And this really illustrates the kind of two areas of work the toolkit addresses in part thinking about policy, even though the main focus really is on curriculum, curriculum development, but the policy piece is there as well. And that's reflected in the title. So let me move it on. So obviously um, we're in this room, we are all concerned about what's happening out there. And as, as Sam said, um, and I know all of us feel, we, we just have to do something in schools more than has been happening. It's quite a gap um, with the absence of ESD related themes in schools. So the toolkit is one of the contributions, obviously the contributions for helping um, educational stakeholders, those in this room and others, to identify, um, to, to carry out strat uh, steps for both analyzing the ESD environment in the national system in your respective country and prospects for how to, to infuse ESD into that. So that was the main agenda. And um, so I will go into that now just a little bit. I, I wanted to acknowledge that education for sustainable development is, it is one of several values-based approaches that we can find that UNESCO has promoted over the years. UNESCO is also promoting global citizenship education, human rights education, an area I've worked a lot in peace education. So, um, and all of these approaches are challenged in the sense that they are, well, they're values oriented and they don't, usually have their own separate subject. So it's always a challenge for UNESCO, for member states, for all, for people like us who are really um, driven by this um, understanding that we need to have more treatment of themes like education for sustainable development and maybe some of these other ones in the curriculum. So how can we have that happen when we have many problems like curriculum overload or inflexibility in the curriculum. So the toolkit was developed um, bearing in mind the experiences of you in the network and our collective understanding also of these kinds of challenges and thinking about how despite this curriculum overload, for example, or, um, 
or or are um, having limited room to maneuver in terms of curriculum reform? How can we still create a toolkit that will help wherever you're you are as an educational stakeholder in your national system of, um, of education and the ESD presence there. So we recognize that it's a challenge um, to try to infuse. And um, that is exactly the, what we, the toolkit was organized around. So that's the center of this triangle. We're assuming that there, sh there will be, should be ESD integration into the national education systems. And it needs to not just be based in one subject. It should be transversal across um, all subjects in order to ensure that every young person graduating from school has some exposure to education for sustainable development and substantive exposure, not just hearing about climate change, but really learning, um, gaining some competencies related to ESD and having ways of being in daily life, in school, in community, at home, that um, helps to um, ensure sustainable development. So the toolkit was organized with this um, idea in mind, also um, with some principles from um, that we already know from practice around what works well in terms of transformative education, because this is a contribution to a wider agenda of transformative education in schools. So for example, the, the idea that competencies for ESD and associated pedagogies should have um, critical thinking and reflection and be action oriented. These were all central to our thinking about the toolkit. So the question is how to get there, right? So basically, again, back to the toolkit, it's a really a technical document. So I do want to emphasize that. And I think we hope that you'll really like that <laughs> because it, it really goes into step by step about what might be involved in setting up a team to do the policy review the curriculum mapping to see what's already there related to ESD themes. How can we think about conceptualizing ESD based on UNESCO documents and good thinking around that? How do we do the analysis? How do we use that analysis to, to strengthen the presence of ESD themes and competencies in the curriculum? How do we monitor that moving forward? So it's really a sort of an A to Z um, toolkit, we think, drawing again, as Sam said, on the really useful experiences that the teams in those pilot countries had already in the last years, absolutely drawing on those as well as um, our, our sort of expert knowledge, if you will, of what policy analysis and, and curriculum analysis and development um, entails. So we try to demystify this. And I do wanna say that we, with all due respect, understand that those of you in your country context have your own ways of working. If you're in a ministry of education, you have your own processes, uh, most likely for reviewing curriculum, asking for public input, developing new curriculum. Curriculum cycles are in every country. So we recognize whether you're in the ministry or you're working at a civil society organization or a think tank that's interacting with the ministry, that you do have ways of working. This toolkit is not prescriptive in that sense. It's more literally a resource for you. It's almost like a way for you to double check ways of working um, that you might bear in mind as you think about, again, this sort of cycle of analysis and curriculum development and review. Um, and it's also, um, but there also is, it's really a meaty toolkit. We think you'll be really excited to see it, the annexes, which is where we find a lot of, a lot of uh, technical um, assistance for um, things like how do you set up a matrix, um, uh, what are some of the good softwares you can use for qualitative analysis? So it's really juicy stuff. And we think that, or hope that that will be useful for you as well. So this is an overview of the main uh, sort of sections of the toolkit. And we have, um, we start at the very top, which is the project setup. In particular, we drew on the, the work of the pilot country teams for this. How do you set it up? And again, maybe that seems self-evident, but we have some things that we offer here in this section that we suggest that you keep in mind. And I'll go into some of those topics in just a little bit. So we have um, we have the project set up. We then we spend a little bit of time with you 
presenting the ESD curriculum framework. I mean, we really have to know what we're talking about. And you, in your country contexts, also need to have some agreement amongst the team members about the definition of education for sustainable development and in practice what that looks like thematically. So, and this connects up later with work that you'll also be doing if you undertake this process related to identifying competencies for education for sustainable development, which will guide the curriculum development process. But we have a section in this toolkit on the actual ESD themes curriculum framework, which is the basis for policy review and curriculum mapping, so we know what we're looking for. Um, that leads to curriculum revision and development. Um, we also have a section um, reminding um, all of us that monitoring the implementation of ESD curriculum is also very important. We also have some hints about assessment for learners. And of course, there any kind of curriculum reform, um, it's self-evident, will also need uh, not only intended curriculum on paper, but associated resources for educators um, and also um, training. So these, we haven't forgotten about that. We don't go into much detail there, but we do but we do acknowledge it. So this is, these are the main sections of the toolkit, which is really reflecting a kind of, again, a cycle of, of, um, of analysis um, and, re and review development and then um, review uh, in terms of evaluation and hopefully revision. We see this as a dynamic process that's ongoing because when even the project teams that will be presenting after me, and I'm really excited to hear them, will I hope say something about what happened after they had done their own curriculum mapping and we're going to be moving forward in curriculum development because um, it's not a process that you do once and then it's finished. And, um, and that's just something to keep in mind. So. However, you and your respective countries get started in this process, however much you use the toolkit. It's really, I think, a way of thinking about this work moving forward in the medium term, not just next year or even in two years, but thinking about it in many years ahead. And we hope the toolkit will be on, um, will have a shelf life um, that will, and they, you know, that will make it useful for for all of us for many years moving forward. So now I'm gonna just share, share a little bit glimpses of what's in different sections. Um, obviously a lot of text here, I'm not gonna read through it, but I wanted just to highlight a few things. So for, in the project setup, you'll see here a list of various considerations. And again, for those of you who are very experienced in managing educational projects, this might look very, familiar to you, but we thought, well, we'll put it in any way. We're thinking we have to acquire res human resources, we have to get political support, but we also um, in the toolkit highlight the importance of working collaboratively with different educational stakeholders in your country who have an interest in ESD or in related things, because there may not be, for example, civil society organizations self-identified as working with sustainable development, but they might be very interested in learner-centered education, a civic engagement, global citizenship, and they are also allies for the ESD effort. So we encourage you to be creative, um, even when you're thinking about who to bring into this into this effort, because it is a learning process for everyone involved. There's very few of us, on myself included, I didn't know very much about ESD until a few years ago. It just wasn't, you know, it wasn't on my. Um, on, on, it was what I was looking at in the work that I was doing. And that's not unusual. So this process of, um, uh, of this ESD um, cycle is also a, a learning process for everyone. And that time has to be taken at this earliest stage when you're bringing people on board. And also when you begin to think about, well, how do we understand ESD? What kinds of ways are we gonna be looking for ESD in our existing curriculum? So I wanted to emphasize that. So inclusiveness, looking for partners, bringing in people that may not be the usual suspects in terms of ESD, especially groups inside of your um, countries that are vulnerable. Um, of course, in general, the UN um, and the human rights perspective is to always bring into, into discussion the voices of those who's not always brought in into these kinds of process, uh, these processes. And in terms of ESD, also those in your countries who may be disproportionately affected 
by climate change because of where they're living in the country or other features of their background. So please also think about really very deliberately bringing in those voices and vulnerable populations into this process. Um, some of the practical things and projects set up also just to mention it, we had a big discussion actually on the writing table, big discussion, but like just a practical point, you know, you want to you will, you'll need access to curriculum in order to analyze it. So you'll have to take some discussions early on about whether we're just gonna look at primary school or we're gonna look at a couple of grades like sixth grade and like the last grade in primary school, the last grade in secondary education, lots of technical decisions that have to be made. And we highlight this in the toolkit. Um, let me move to the next one. So, so then we have a very, um, technical part of the toolkit devoted to policy review and curriculum mapping. And you can see in front of you some of the topics that are taken up. Um, I, I used to teach monitoring and evaluation at Teachers College at Columbia. I also still teach it online at HREA. I really like this kind of work. It's very nerdy work. Um, those of you who are on research teams, um, you'll probably relate to a lot of the things that are in this, this chapter. If you in this room are not someone who's done this kind of work, this code book might not be a language that you're used to, um, but you'll have to bring in people um, who, are, who are familiar researchers um, who are able to, um, to work in these ways. But this is the kind of information that we find in the toolkit. So it's setting up um, you know, the keywords, setting up the matrices for um, documenting um, what is found when you do the analysis, and then actually ways of, 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 of categorizing that information so that you're not only like looking for numbers of times, for example, that biodiversity shows up in curriculum, but other kinds of important information to help you figure out where you can strengthen ESD in the curriculum. So it's not only how often is it showing up different keywords, but where is it showing up in the curriculum? Which subjects? How thickly is this theme addressed? Is it just referenced lightly or is there an actual like lesson um, related to it like biodiversity? And is it looking at it just locally or is it also looking at it nationally or even globally? So trying to capture this kind of information in the, in the analysis so that you have information moving forward for curriculum analysis. And hopefully that's, that's clear. So, um, and then I have, and just an example of the kinds of, annexes that you'll find in tables inside the toolkit. I don't know about you all, but I really, really like resources that have a lot of illustrations, you know, boxes inside of the main text that have like case examples or how to's um, templates, that kind of thing. And we really tried to load up the toolkit with those kinds of helpful um, additions. And this is just one example here of a partial matrix on how you could use what you might use when you're, you know, you're, you're documenting the presence of an ESD theme. We have an example here, you know, the keyword, the number of times you're finding on a page and the curriculum, the page number, the text excerpt itself. So you can go back and see exactly what is said about this theme and any comments that you as a researcher might have about it. So I don't need to go into more detail here, but just to give you a flavor for the kind of thing you'll find in the toolkit. Now, in terms of curriculum revision and development, which is another main section, um, obviously this is why we're doing the analysis is to set us up so we know what's there, but also even just knowing what's there you know, there's different ways of looking at what's already in your curriculum. One is to see where gaps are that you might need to fill. Another is to see what's already there that maybe can be extended, right? So, um, and you need to think about the strategies. Again, is it transversal? If you're finding most of the references to ESD in the science curriculum, like environmental science, then you need to be working in the social sciences and the humanities to bring in some related themes, right? So it's also thinking about your curricular strategy overall. That's a part of what you'll be doing in this process. So thinking about curriculum strategies, getting clear about the competencies and learning outcomes you have in mind for your learners. By the time you know people are graduating from primary school in your country, what are the competencies around ESD do you imagine for them? Same with you know, the ending point at secondary school level. What are the competencies we need? Because that needs to drive your learning outcomes and ultimately what curriculum is developed. That's self-evident. Um, 
We have here, I just wanted to give you an idea of competencies. We have in the toolkit competencies that have been developed um, for the different domains um, that we have for ESD related to the environment, economics, and, uh, and society. And we try to link these up with the SDG goals. So there's a lot of really, I think, cool thinking about linking up the SDG goals with competencies that can drive um, the educational reform efforts in your countries, whatever curriculum um, agenda you decide to take up. And of course, this is also linked back to your earlier definitions of ESD that you accepted in your own research. So here's just an example of, of competencies that can be used to drive the um, writing process. And the writing process itself, I just have a couple more minutes here and then I'm done. The writing process we also acknowledged um, can have at least three different approaches. Like one could be that you find in certain curriculum that you analyze that there is already some reference to ESD related themes and you just wanna extend them. Maybe you wanna add an experiential element. Uh, maybe, you know, it's, so you're not working with uh, to fill a gap per se, but to extend what's there. So um, that's one way of thinking about curriculum revision. Uh, another is that you, you see a, a real gap, like anything related to ESD is essentially in the natural sciences and you really wanna move it into those other areas. So then you really might need to develop some new curriculum. It may be a new course. It could also just be a, a theme that's I, that's clearly linked with ESD that gets infused into other subjects and to literature and the kinds of things that, sh that, that young people are reading in the class and that could be related to sustainable development. So you might have to develop some new curriculum and you'd have to find people in your, in your, on your team, your research team or others to do this. Finally, there are resources that have been developed out there. Increasingly, you were finding more resources. Two years ago, there was much less, but you may wanna think about adapting something that has been developed outside of your country context. We have um, suggestions for ways to think about localizing because of course that's very, very important not just to take something from outside and use it without really scrutinizing it and making some changes so that it's culturally relevant and also relevant for other features of your of your school background. So we also have these kinds of, of hints in, your, in, the, in the toolkit. So again, many examples and templates to choose from. We're all really excited and as Sam said, relieved. The toolkit is done. We're very happy with it on our side and really, really looking forward to hearing back from you all um, um, when you're using it, how it's working for you. And as Sam said, and, um, and we all feel this is a living document. So it will absolutely be a document that we can add to. So as you proceed in using it, as you have, maybe you have things that we could add, maybe you have some corrections we need to make. Um, we're, you know, really um, open for your giving us input like that. So again, the toolkit, here for coordination and planning. It's got a lot of technical elements to it. We know that this is going to happen because of your dedication. We hope the toolkit will inspire you um, to do more in your own country context. And remember, it's a, it's a long-term game here, and we hope that this will help you um, get started or renew the efforts you're already engaged in. Thanks so much for uh, your attention, and, and good luck with your efforts. Thank you so much, Professor, for the extreme detail that you've given us on this practical tool that we can use in our own context, whether that's at the local level or the national level. And thank you as well for all the time and effort that you put into this project alongside uh, the other authors and the Global Schools team. Uh, we really appreciate it and we appreciate your presentation uh, today. So. As um, professor, the professor said, um, we are open to uh, comments and feedback. Um, please sign up for our newsletter, and you can also contact us on the Global Schools website, which is globalschoolsprogram.org. Uh, so now I will be uh, turning it over to uh, Professor Sachs, who is the president of the UN Sustainable Development Solutions Network. And before I do, I will use this time for those of you who have just joined to give us a bit of a summary of what we have already done um, in the first portion of our call. 
Um, so we heard from Sam who had um, a great uh, speech um, to kind of welcome us and take us into this toolkit and thank everyone that was involved. Uh, we also heard from Rocio at Simmons Gamisa about their social impact that they are doing all around the world and their involvement uh, with supporting global schools and SDSN uh, networks. And we also had this fantastic opportunity uh, to hear from Professor uh, Felisa Tibbetts on the toolkit in itself and what tools are available on policy and curriculum mapping, as well as curriculum development and the variety of strategies and how we see this could be used in different contexts. And now we will be hearing from Professor Sachs. Um, we will be hearing from him for about uh, 10 minutes on his outlook on transformative education on target 4.7 and what SDSN uh, is doing in the education space and, and where we see the future heading when it comes to transformative education. So Professor Sachs, over to you. Thank you very much. Congratulations to all of you. This is a, a worldwide group effort, uh, especially, of course, to the team that has prepared the toolkit. I'm most grateful. Uh, I'm very eager to uh, dig into it. I've just received it also together with everybody else. So I'm uh, eager to, to, to uh, look and to learn uh, and uh, to have this as a, as a great uh, tool for a, what is really a worldwide movement. And I see uh, lots of the leaders of that movement all over uh, my Zoom screen. So let me take a moment just to thank you uh, profoundly for helping to educate our young people so that they understand the world that they will be inheriting and leading soon. Uh, yesterday, I had a chance uh, from where I am uh, this week in Vienna to use Zoom to speak to a class of sixth graders in Brooklyn, New York. And it was very touching because New York uh, experienced uh, a massive environmental crisis last week when the huge forest fires that are raging in Canada darkened the air for a week in New York and the kids had school closed one day. Uh, they were wearing uh, masks again uh, for the rest of the school week. And I was very, uh, very gratified to know that the teacher had taken the time to explain the crisis to them, where it came from, the links with the climate change, I, one of the sixth graders explained to me how to make the world safer through decarbonization, uh, changing the energy system, uh, and all of it, of course, is very poignant. It's very sad that 11-year-olds are losing school and seeing environmental crises like this, but this is happening everywhere, and it's uh, whether it's droughts, floods, hurricanes, uh, forest fires were really in the age where our children need to understand this uh, they're living with it making a curriculum is partly opening one's eyes to the actual events of life that are taking place right now and helping through science through a civics course through a government course through history to explain and empower uh, today's uh, young people so that they really understand first the world's interconnected and this was one of the lessons for the children in Brooklyn because the the air crisis emerged from Canada so in this particular instance and so this was a very vivid example that it's not the city you live in it's not the country you live in it's the world you live in uh, it's all interconnected uh, second, it's a dramatic event in their lives. There will be more of them. Uh, I so much recall uh, the words of one of our very close colleagues in ESD, uh, Radhika Iyengar, who was born and raised in Bhopal, India, 
where the great industrial catastrophe took place of Union Carbide, a massive pollution event that killed thousands of people. And she said when she was growing up, even though the disaster had happened in her city, it was never discussed once in school. There was no explanation. There was no understanding. It was as if it had happened on another planet. And this is the opposite of how real education should occur. And with the toolkit, I was so grateful to hear uh, the emphasis on participatory learning and action oriented learning problem solving because that's really what we're after in education for sustainable development. Let me tell you that as an organization that I'm very honored to be leading the UN Sustainable Development Solutions Network, or what we call it SDSN, is deeply devoted to building uh, curricular materials, education materials, all for free and online for you, the teachers, uh, to use, to be able to access. Uh, and uh, the SDG Academy uh, website uh, has, uh, I think, now well over 30 full length courses generally for upper secondary or university level. So uh, not uh, K through 12 necessarily, but the idea is to build this knowledge base and this curriculum together. So let me thank Global Schools. It's a wonderful program. Uh, Amanda and Sam and Professor Tibbet, whom I, I don't think we've met personally, uh, but I was so happy to hear, and others who are helping to uh, guide this project, but especially the worldwide teachers that are the project, that are, that are the group effort. I, I just want to tell you how incredibly, incredibly exciting this is and how important it is, how grateful I am, and how grateful, by the way, world leaders are in the Global Schools program. This is well known for this pioneering work at UNESCO, at the UN headquarters. I will champion what you're doing. Again, let me just uh, conclude by thanking you for the new toolkit, which we'll all be looking at. We'll all be making suggestions. One of the virtues of our digital age is that documents are live documents. So help us build this to be really the thrilling live uh, toolkit that we need for the education breakthroughs that you're making. And uh, Amanda, back to you, but uh, real congratulations. I'm so grateful for this. And uh, to everybody on the screen, thank you so much for being part of this. It's really what you're doing uh, that is, uh, is so thrilling. And every time I read about the experiences of global schools, it uh, really brings a lot of joy. Uh, to me and to uh, everybody that knows about it, uh, how exciting this worldwide venture is. So thanks to all of you for letting me join briefly and back to the toolkit. Thank you so much, Professor Sachs, for the kind words and for also giving your perspectives and insights on education in general and what SDSN is doing. Um, thank you so much again, and I know your motivating words will truly inspire the teachers and advocates and project officers, as well as the wider community we have on this call. So thank you. Great. Bye-bye, everybody. So now we will be hearing from a panel of experts and researchers and professors <laughs> that have used this toolkit in their context before. Um, so we will hear from three individuals. And first, I will be turning it over to uh, Dr. Richardson Adai Manunkum from the University of Education, Winneba in Ghana. Give me one second here. Um, so Dr. Richardson is a senior lecturer of curriculum and pedagogy at the University of Education, Winneba, Ghana. 
He holds a PhD in curriculum and instruction from the University of Wisconsin-Madison, and he has worked in various capacities as a teacher, a researcher, a teacher, educator, and curriculum developer. Um, so Dr. Richardson will be talking about the project and the pilot that Global Schools carried out uh, in Ghana that led into the development of this toolkit and the lessons learned uh, that came out of that work and shaped um, the work that you see today. So Dr. Richardson, over to you. Thank you very much, Amanda, and a very warm welcome to everyone, uh, wherever you're you are connecting from me. So exciting to see um, global the global community represented here, and obviously because we are launching something related to global school. Um, and I bring greetings to from my team from the University of Education Winneba, and we're very proud to be associated with this project that we believe is going to improve education and secure the future of this world for our children. Um, the call came for us to participate, and my university, University of Education, Winnebam, it's the only teacher education university in Ghana, the one, the only one that is uh, solely devoted to teacher education. And we found this as a great opportunity to improve something that will be useful for us and for the global community. Uh, my team was made up of academics in education and also in communication. And we got a lot of support from Millennium Promise Alliance, um, which is an organization in Ghana championing ESD. And we took it beyond just an academic exercise to something very personal. And so we devoted a lot of interest and energy into it because we were hopeful of the outcome. And we are very excited that um, we have been part of this thing that is going to uh, bring a lot of gains to uh, the global community. Um, I will just talk briefly about our experience with the school toolkit. Um, for people who are wondering, and I, I saw from the chat, people are eager to use and, and excited to use it, and it's very encouraging and heartwarming. Um, I want to re-echo what Professor Tibbet said. It, this is a very easy to use kind of toolkit. Uh, we did not take a lot of time and energy to understand because the instructions were quite clear. And that was even at a point where it was a draft. So now with all the revisions, I think it's even gotten clearer, uh, which will make it very easy to use. It is very comprehensive because it has guidelines for assessing learning outcomes for all 255 ESDs. There are ESD learning outcomes are 255, which comprises uh, goals and outcomes for each of the 17 SDGs. And so all of them are covered. And what I personally like is that unlike other toolkits that make you just check and quantify a number of occurrences and frequencies, this one actually allows you to look out for explicit and implicit references. Uh, to um, ideas and, and knowledge forms and experiences that we're expecting. And so it, it made it quite easier and interesting because in our context, you might not get a keyword, but once you read the whole portion of the curriculum, you are able to get some implicit references. The, the, the tool is also very scientific because it follows the tenets of research. And that's uh, what Prof. Tibbet was saying, that if you're a researcher, you'd be very happy about it. It was adaptable. It's not like a, 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 a very rigid tool that cannot be adapted to different contexts. And we were able to adapt it to our context, especially in curricular materials that are not written in, in English. You have to find ways to, to translate them. But even with that, there are, there are room in there for you to do some adaptation, which we found very interesting. And for our use for our pilot, we also found it to be very insightful because it's it's quite easy to just say, oh, our curriculum has SDG and we are, we are doing very well um, teaching our kids and providing opportunities for them to learn SDG. But when you subject it to critical um, scrutiny as this tool allowed us to do, then we saw where the lapses actually were. Because for example, one intriguing finding that came from our own was that goal one, which is about poverty, was not contained in any of 11 out of 12 subject curricula that we, we, we studied, which was quite surprising. 
uh, for a context where po poverty is so obvious and learners are experiencing it daily, it's surprising that you have 11 subject curricula not talking about poverty at all. And so these are some of the benefits that you are able to get when you use uh, the toolkit to analyze your curricula. We saw that eight out of the 17 goals, for example, were not captured in all the subject curricula, which was also quite surprising because we thought we were doing well. Of course, we saw some exciting areas where some goals like three, four, and five were doing quite well, a lot of um, coverage being given to it. Uh, so as uh, Professor Tibbet said, the curriculum, the, the toolkit helps you to be able to assess and know where you need to direct efforts and then um, make some interventions in order to improve SDG coverage and, and tension in the curriculum. So beyond the project that we did, we were very excited. And so we submitted our report to the Minister of Education and shared all the interest and highlights that were coming out. Personally, he was also very interested. And for Ghana, it came as a, at a very opportune time. We were in the process of reviewing our national curricula from the primary school to the secondary school. And at the time we were doing it, it, it was only the primary school curriculum that was done. Uh, we we're still in the process of doing the uh, junior high and the senior high curricula. So the minister promised that we're going to pay attention to those things. And so uh, we were very excited that we we're able to at least influence it at that point. So we are sure that the DHS and SHS curricula will probably do a better than what we had earlier. For us as an institution at the University of Education, Winneba, we also took a cue and noticed that if we're going to prepare the next generation of teachers, then we need to better prepare them about ESDs. So we have included uh, a course in one of our programs, Master of uh, Philosophy in Curriculum and Pedagogy. And our students are now taking a course on um, pedagogy and curriculum for sustainable development. And I'm proud to say that my students are here and they already have an assignment that they are going to use this toolkit to do. And so they are watching with keen interest and are excited that it's launched finally, that they can also use to uh, complete the assignment and then learn to um, practice um, this whole project with the toolkit. So we are excited and we are very hopeful of this toolkit changing our world. And we are very proud to be part of it. I want to encourage everyone here and share it, for us to share the news and to encourage all educators and researchers to access and use because the toolkit is comprehensive, it's scientific, and it's adaptable. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Professor. We are very glad to hear your insights and the specifics on how this was used in practice. And thank you for all of the contributions that you made, as well as feedback that you gave our team based on your experiences. We're very happy to have you here, and we look forward to your continued uh, contributions and learnings um, in order to continue adapting the toolkit in future iterations. So now I will turn it so we can hear from another individual about their experience in the Global Schools pilot. So I will be handing it over to Mrs. Uh, Miriam Kodari. She is the ESD project manager at the Hassan II International Environmental Training Center, which is the academic entity of the Mohammed VI Foundation for Environmental Protection in Morocco. Uh, she oversees several programs, including Eco Schools, the Young Reporters for the Environment, and Global Schools in Morocco. She has five years of experience in environmental education and uh, sustainable development, and she has managed a plethora of projects that have been beneficial to the education community. Uh, so we look forward to hearing about your experiences, Miriam, and we will hand it over to you. Thank you, Amanda. Thank you for this uh, great presentation. Um, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone, wherever you are. So first of all, the Mohammed VI Foundation for Environmental Protection and its academic entity, the uh, Hassan Sagan International Environmental Training Center, are pleased to participate in this event for the launch of the Global Schools Toolkit. Uh, this Toolkit is a complete working tool based on laborious research in three pilot countries, notably Morocco, that I'm representing today with hopefully the uh, Professor Merzok. 
since its inception in uh, uh, 2001, the Mohammed VI Foundation for Environmental Protection, chaired by Her Royal Highness Princess Lala Hasna, has been a forerunner in strengthening environmental education and sustainable development. Firmly committed to this cause uh, and recognizing that education plays a pivotal role in shaping the mindset and values of uh, our future generation, the foundation has implemented various initiatives designed to raise awareness, involve communities, and encourage environmental preservation, especially among youth, including the Global Schools Program, initiative of the UN Sustainable Development Solution Network. I would also like to acknowledge the remarkable achievements of the pilot phase of the Global Schools Program. During this phase, a select group of schools had the opportunity to implement the program's framework and guidance to integrate sustainability into their curricula and also daily activities. By doing so, the results have been truly inspiring. It empowers students and also educators to become agents of uh, change, driving the transition toward a more uh, sustainable and greener world. For more details, I hope that I don't think if uh, Professor Marzouk will uh, will join us. So, um, um, so I will maybe uh, if uh, Amanda uh, uh, permit it. I will also uh, present uh, the Moroccan experience from my modest modest perspective. So, um, by by I will do that by presenting a summary of research uh, findings from the Global Schools Program in Morocco, which has been successfully implemented by the Mohammed VI Foundation in collaboration with the Ministry of National Education and the Akhawi University. So ex extensive research and monitoring, several key findings have emerged, highlighting the impact of effectiveness of the program. The first point is the increased awareness and knowledge. The research indicates a significant increase in environmental awareness and knowledge among students and educators involved in the Global Schools Program. Also, the curriculum and activities implemented under the program have successfully convened uh, important concepts related to environmental conservation, biodiversity, climate change, and sustainable development. The second point is the behavioral change, which is really, uh, uh, really important for us. So the, the program has effectively influenced positive behaviors changes among students, teachers, and the wider uh, school community. Research shows that participants have adopted sustainable practices, such as waste reduction, energy conservation, water management, and also eco-friendly trans transportations. Uh, these changes ex extend beyond the school environment and positively impact students, homes, and also local communities. The third point is the interdisciplinary learning. The Global Schools Program has demonstrated also the benefits of the um, interdisciplinary learning, integrating environmental topics, topics across various subjects. Uh, researchers have found also that this approach enhances students' understanding of environmental challenges and promotes critical thinking, problem solving, and also creativity. The, um, the fourth a point is the empowerment and engagement. So the program students have been empowered to take an active role in environmental initiatives. Research also highlights increased student engagement in extracurricular activities, such as environmental club, tree planting campaigns, uh, as a Pabla plastic, uh, clean, uh, a Pabla plastic uh, campaign with, which have uh, led by the Mohammed VI Foundation. Also, uh, the mm -hmm. EcoSchools program in collaboration with him. So this engagement fosters uh, a sense of responsibility, leadership skills, and a lifelong commitment to environmental stewardship. Uh, furthermore, to ensure the effective implementation of the research finding on uh, drive long-term sustainable sustainability. Uh, it was crucial to establish a strong knowledge sharing and capacity building framework. So this framework will facilitate the exchange of best practices, lesson learned and innovative approach among participants, school educators and relevant stakeholders. Uh, 
By fostering this collaboration and continuous learning, the Global Schools Program can evolve and adapt to emerging challenges, further strengthening its impact on environmental education and sustainability in Morocco. So to do so, the Moroccan team will continue working uh, with the uh, SDSN in this pilot and, it's, and is uh, addressing uh, an action plan in three uh, principal points. The first point is, the, uh, is to launch a micro case study. This action uh, aims to exp expand the implementation of the Global Schools Program to all eco-schools in, uh, in the, um, in, uh, the Ifran city. So the Mohammed VI Foundation will collaborate with the uh, Akhawa University and the Ministry of National Education to ensure effective implementation and support of the program. Uh, the study will also involve assessing the scalability of the program, identifying challenges and developing strategies to overcome them. It also will monitor the impact of the program on student learning outcomes, behavior changes, and community engagement in the programs of IFREN. The findings from this study will also inform future program in improvements and provide valuable insights for scaling up the Global Schools Program to other regions in Morocco. The second uh, action uh, is to is a macro case study launch of a re research phase in the in Marrakesh to map a new subjects integrated into the school curriculum following the first pilot phase of the pro of the project. This action will focus on launching a research phase in um, in Marrakesh to evaluate the integration of the new subject, as I said, into the the school uh, curriculum. And uh, last point is the launch of an impact study to develop a national roadmap. This action focus, which is also a phase on uh, in the uh, action plan of the SDS and, and Global Schools Program. This action focuses on conducting uh, an impact study to assess the overall effectiveness and outcomes of the Global Schools Program on a national scale uh, and will evaluate also the program achievements, challenges, uh, faces and lessons learned across different regions of, uh, of Morocco. The Mohammed VI Foundation, in collaboration with relevant stakeholders and research institutions, will also lead this uh, study and uh, provide a comprehensive understanding of the program's contribution on environmental education. Um, I think that it's all for me. Thank you for uh, for the opportunity to uh, to participate in this event and hope that this tool uh, will be will will make change. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Miriam, for those words and for explaining in detail exactly how the project looked in Morocco. We really appreciate um, all of the collaboration over the years, and we're very excited to continue uh, seeing what occurs with these uh, continued programs in Morocco. So thank you so much for being here and for uh, providing so much context to the participants today. So now I will bring us to a closing. As uh, Sam said in the beginning, uh, Professor Mustafa Oz-Turk uh, was called away um, and unfortunately cannot be here today, but uh, sends his regards. And all of the research uh, from Turkey can also be found on the same link that we are sharing uh, with the toolkit in the chat. So if you are interested uh, specifically in that work, uh, please feel free to read the detailed report and uh, share any ideas with us. Um, as final steps, uh, we will be sending out the recording via our newsletter, so please sign up and the link has been shared in the chat itself. Uh, we will also uh, welcome any ideas or um, implementations of the toolkit and the use of the resources that we have provided. Um, please feel free to send those in to us at the email shared in the chat, which is globalschools at uh, unsdsn.org. Uh, we wish you a happy reading of the toolkit, and we cannot wait to hear more about your experiences. Uh, we are very excited going forward, uh, working with SDSN networks, as well as our schools and advocates in regions all across the world. Uh, you are really the heart of the Global Schools Program. And thank you so much for the work that you do uh, in the classroom as educators, pushing forth ESD, as this is the only way we will truly uh, transform education is a movement of all of us together. So thank you for this wonderful community that we have built and for the great collaborations that have come out of this project.
Uh, I hope everyone has a great rest of their morning, afternoon, and evening, and we look forward to seeing you on the next Global Schools event. Thank you, everyone.